Thank you very much. Uh, it's it's wonderful to be here, and I, I hope uh, to sort of breeze through this relatively quickly, because I understand there's going to be a lot of questions. But at the same time, hopefully, the uh, the information in the presentation will be of use, uh, and we can continue the the, uh, the discussion afterwards. Um, so oh, it's working. Okay, great. Um, so first of all, uh, I just uh, my introduction. I'm from Paddle Eight. Um, and I wanted to give you a quick overview of uh, some of the things that we'll be discussing. I want to initially look at the development of the online art market space um, and how it came to be where we are today, um, and then how the online companies have changed the market as we know it. Um, we will then move on to looking at some of the companies that I think will be of interest uh, to the galleries uh, here and ar around the world to pay attention to and follow. Um, and then uh, we'll, we'll also be discussing so, or looking at how you can use them to your advantage uh, with a few case studies as well. And then we'll open it, open it up to, uh, to some discussions. Um, so if we first have a look at the development of the space, um, what you can see, and I've sort of broken this out into successes and failures, failures at the top, uh, successes at the bottom. Uh, perhaps failures is too harsh a word, um, but in, in this case, uh, it, it's, it's sort of appropriate. Um, the first and foremost, I think it's important to draw attention to uh, the fact that of all of these endeavors, uh, they, they are in of themselves uh, uh, a uh, sort of a, uh, a leap of faith, if you will. Um, if you and, and I think Sotheby's is a fantastic example of that. Uh, they very early on realized that there was a huge amount of potential with the online space. Um, by uh, they, and they realized that potential by partnering with Amazon uh, in 1999. Unfortunately, their timing was somewhat terrible uh, because the, uh, the, the crash that came about later on in 1999 uh, resulted in a very rapid exit, uh, and the two companies parted ways less than a year later. Um, but the, the, the thought and the, the idea was in the right place. Uh, they tried it again with eBay uh, and, uh, and yet again quite recently with eBay, which we can talk about later. Uh, that partnership ended in 2003, um, and that was uh, in large part, which is something I'll come to in the next slide, because the, the, uh, the online buying community wasn't in a place to be able to understand or appreciate how to buy at that art online at that time. Um, Amazon Art is, is an example of uh, a, a situation where, in theory, you have a fantastic, cu a huge community uh, open to purchasing online, uh, and yet the execution of that particular website uh, was perhaps not quite uh, uh, placed as well as it could have been. It's ambitious, but just not really very well done. Some of the successes, on the other hand, uh, include Artnet, which was one of the few companies to actually make it through the 1999 crash. Um, they are first and foremost known for their data business, uh, which is really the core of their company and, and the, the, the product that continues to, uh, uh, to, to serve them best. Um, I would be remiss if I didn't say Paddle 8 was one of the uh, 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 successes over the past three years. Uh, the rise of, that, uh, of, of our company has been absolutely fantastic. Um, and a lot of that has to do with the way in which we interact with our, our users and, and our uh, transaction process. A number of things that we'll be getting on to later on. Uh, and then lastly, Christie's, which may seem surprising, uh, but it's there because they are undergoing one of the biggest uh, innovations, reinventions of any major old establishment company. They have made it their mission. Stephen Murphy is adamant that it is, is his mission to transform Christie's into a modern auction house, which, when you think about it, is really quite difficult because you're talking about a 300-odd-year-old company um, that they are trying to reinvent and trying to sort of haul in a completely new and different direction. Um, and again, some of these things that we will touch on a little bit later. Um, so in order to sort of give, give a, a, a wrap-up or an overview of some of the things that have changed in the course of the development, um, some of the things that have been integral to the successes of those companies, um, I wanted to touch on, uh, on four different points. The first is uh, quality. And what I mean by quality is how you present your data, your information, your details, your images, that kind of thing. 
It is phenomenally important when you are trying to uh, have a, a, an online buyer uh, purchase an artwork which is perhaps 10, 20, 30 thousand dollars or euros. Um, th the information you have to provide is, is as good as, if not better, than what they may find in the physical landscape. Um, so I you have to bear this in mind as galleries when you're talking to either partners or when you're thinking about your website, the level of scrutiny that, that the information that you put up there, if you are looking to sell that particular piece, will be very, very high, and you should assume that it's as detailed as if, as if the person were in the room with you. Um, the other thing is usability. Uh, as I mentioned before, when you think about uh, ventures like uh, Amazon Art and that kind of thing, um, if, if a client or if a, a customer or a, a, a visitor to a website doesn't feel engaged and uh, doesn't feel like the, the uh, system is easily uh, navigated or easy to transact in, you will lose that person in a matter of seconds. They will very quickly realize that the website uh, or the, the, uh, the interaction is too frustrating and too difficult, and they'll be on to the next one. Um, so it's, it, it's very important to make sure that the platforms aren't clunky and that they're being uh, uh, elegantly portrayed. Uh, the, the third point, which I touched on earlier, is the maturity of the online buying market. And I think this is where, as I was saying with Sotheby's and Amazon and eBay, um, where their, their downfall was. And that was that the online buying community was not in a position to be purchasing artworks at higher price points in the early 2000s. Most of the time, people were buying, uh, I don't know, toothpaste. Um, n nothing of any real importance. And yes, they were buying it from Amazon, but that doesn't translate to buying uh, a 50,000 euro work uh, on, the, on the same site. Uh, the last thing is trust, and again, if looking at uh, Sotheby's, and you can uh, sw swap out Amazon or eBay in this case. Um, obviously, Sotheby's has a huge amount of trust. They have a long legacy and a fantastic uh, uh, record of, of doing uh, wonderful, wonderful business over the past uh, couple hundred years. In conjunction with that, they were partnered with companies that were less than five years old and were uh, somewhat tarnished from a uh, sort of rapid rise and, and rapid descent. Um, they both have uh, lives beyond the crash of 1999, um, but the implicit trust that's required to sell artwork at that level was missing. Um, so if you don't have that, you won't, you won't have long-lasting buyers. Um, a manifestation of that, literally a screenshot um, of, the, uh, of the Sotheby's Amazon website. Uh, if you take all of the points that I was talking about, uh, you will see them on this, on this uh, screen. So first of all, obviously, there's the Sotheby's Amazon name. One you trust, one is somewhere you, where you bought your kids, uh, I don't know, uh, guidebooks for school or something. Um, and then the other one is a complete lack of images. It looks like they did have some images here before, but they had three, and that's it. And meanwhile, there's all of this very, it looks like, it, it, I mean, I'm sure people remember how websites used to look. This is how they used to look. They weren't very engaging, not very exciting. So meanwhile, if you swap it out and we look at what websites are today, this is a, a, an auction page on the Paddle 8 website. And you start to see some of the things that I've been talking about uh, uh, being realized. So first of all, it is phenomenally engaging. There's a giant image. Um, not only are the names associated with the sale uh, enticing, but the image ex excel itself is exciting. It's very easy to navigate. That your, your calls to action have been reduced to a, a core few. Um, it's uh, night and day from what it was in, in 2000, which if you go back to here, you can actually see that this is screen grabbed uh, May 11th, uh, 2000. So that's 14 years, but it's night and day in terms of uh, people's willingness to purchase online from, from one version to the next. You can see in a little, little bit more detail uh, on, a, on a, an actual lot page. Uh, if you click on a lot, you see the image. You can see you can share it with people. You see a description. You see uh, s uh, s which exhibitions it's been in, what the condition report is, the location, and a little bit about the artist. Um, and you also see dimensions. You see all of the necessary information, how to join, all of that stuff. So it's, it, you have to bear in mind, as I said before, that, that uh, although Sotheby's, uh, Sotheby's previous 
partnerships didn't work out. It's not that they didn't work out because the, uh, uh, the idea was wrong. It, they didn't work out because the world wasn't ready yet, um, which is in part why I think they've revisited this relationship with eBay. Um, it's a whole nother discussion as to whether I think that's um, uh, the, the right direction or not, but we can get to that a little bit later. Um, so moving on from that then, uh, I, I think it's important to consider how th some of these companies have changed the art market that we work in um, and how they are very different today from what they were 14 years ago. And to that end, I think one of the most important changes is actually uh, information. We now have information at our fingertips, whether we are artists, whether we are dealers, whether we are collectors, whether we are museums. The amount of information, whether it's sales information, whether it's prior exhibitions, that we have available to us in the internet is enormous. And it's game changing for the entire art market. And there's some debate, um, perhaps we, uh, something else, again, we can talk about a little bit later, about whether transparency is good or bad for the art market. I am in the uh, belief that it is very, very good for the art market, um, in part because if you were to examine uh, a corollary market, for example, if you look at hedge funds or something like that, hedge funds traditionally were not well regulated or transparent up until the mid 2000s at which point regulation came in and everybody thought it would be the end of uh, the end of the hedge fund meanwhile there's uh, I the complete opposite took place hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars poured into hedge funds now i understand that the, there's a difference between art and hedge funds and financial markets and the art market of course but i see it as an example of how transparency can actually help people understand uh, the importance uh, of, of participating in a market and how a market is open and available for business. Um, I think it's, it's a, a, a confluence to success. Um, it, it, it definitely supports it. Um, the other thing that uh, uh, some of these companies, whether they are directly related to the art market or whether they are uh, on the periphery of it, uh, have, have had a huge impact on is access. So what I mean by access is opening up the entire globe, the global community, 7 billion people, um, to being able to see an exhibition at a gallery online in Berlin, or being able to see an auction uh, online in New York. Um, meanwhile, they could be based in Beijing, they could be based in uh, Seoul, they could be based in Sao Paulo, any, any number of places all around the world. This opening up, this, this globalization of, of uh, the market is, is uh, extremely important and it has ramifications for individual businesses in, in what would otherwise have been very localized markets. And I've seen galleries based in, be it Kansas City in the US or I if it's uh, Strasbourg or whatever it may be, selling to clients in complete opposite end of the, of the world. I mean, we're looking at sales to people in Hong Kong. We're looking at sales to people in Sydney. And that interaction and that relationship would not have been possible were it not for the internet. And I think being able to seize that, being able to grasp that uh, opportunity is, is hugely important and something that has to be factored into a gallery's uh, strategic uh, decision making when it comes to figuring out who to work with uh, and, and what, uh, what online companies can do for your business. Um, some of the other areas that I think are important uh, uh, and have changed significantly or have had change forced upon them um, I in this arena as well are economics. So on the economic side of things, a lot of the uh, online companies, one of the compelling arguments that they, they make to clients who they work with, be they... Uh, uh, other dealers or be they galleries, be they artists or collectors, is that there is a, uh, a, an economic benefit, there is a, a reduced overhead and reduced transaction cost to operating online. Um, we've seen this in our company, I see it in other companies, I saw it at Artnet. Um, it's, it's something which you, you can very quickly and very easily translate to and, and hand on to your clients that benefit. And that's one of the major reasons why there's such a disruption taking place, uh, uh, especially if you look at the auction market where you see Sotheby's and Christie's with uh, very sort of 
healthy uh, commissions um, on, uh, on artworks being sold typically below uh, half a million dollars or half a million euros. Um, they, those auction houses tend not to be as accommodating in, in uh, amending or reducing commission structures. Uh, our commission structures are already as low as they can get. So it, th those uh, benefits are being handed on to clients, and that's what I mean when I, when I talk about uh, ec economics on that side. Um, interface and usability, I mentioned earlier, uh, it, it's something which I think is hugely important um, and opens up uh, uh, the industry to, to business everywhere, uh, whatever, whatever language you, you may be speaking. Um, lastly, I actually think that this one is very important, and that, that is the inherent competition within the online uh, market, within the online uh, co companies operating online within that market. Um, it's to the client's benefit. So there are a number of companies, a lot of them do a very similar uh, uh, task or a very similar service. Um, the, the real goal here is for the, uh, <laughs> Uh, to put it uh, as, as harshly as possible, survival of the fittest. It's, it's the one who, who offers you the, uh, the best opportunity, the, the type of service you're looking for in a way that is uh, efficient, in a way that is engaging, in a way that uh, keeps you coming back. And that, I, I actually think, is to uh, every client's benefit in that case. Um, and, and you have to bear in mind that for a, a vast majority of these companies, um, you are all potential clients. So this is all to your benefit as well. Um, so moving, I, I've got some examples here, and I can share the, uh, um, the slideshow uh, so you can see some of the examples, but I'm not going to dwell on it because, as I said, I know we have uh, li limited time with so many questions pending. Uh, with all of that in mind, I wanted to highlight a few companies which I think are of interest and maybe of use uh, before we move on to the case studies, which I think uh, will be uh, also uh, uh, examples of, of hopefully some, some companies in, in the room. Um, Padlate, as I mentioned, it's New York-based, uh, uh, offices in London and, and LA. It's considered and referred to as the leader in the emerging contemporary art world. Um, it, it, it offers highly curated uh, and, and successful monthly auctions, uh, typically of contemporary art, but there is, uh, we are doing uh, expanding into modern design, high-end jewelry, rare watches, that kind of thing. Um, so it's, it's developing out in a number of different regions. Um, the contemporary sales are not limited to just the US. There have been sales for African contemporary art. There's been sales for Middle Eastern contemporary art, so on and so forth. Uh, Asian contemporary and Latin American contemporary are coming up. Um, so that gives you an overview of, of that company and how uh, it may or may not align with your own inherent business. And the, the, uh, the price points typically range between 500 and, and 200,000. Uh, somewhere in that range. And again, I'll talk about each one of these companies and how they relate to uh, example companies in, in the case studies. Um, Auctionada, which is German-based, uh, also online auctions. They actually host live auctions. It's, it's a, you see a stream online and you'll see works come up uh, for, for bidding and hammer and you see a guy uh, literally hammering things as an auctioneer in front of you. Um, so it's, it's, uh, it's a little bit more like what we, you would see Sotheby's or Christie's do online with a live feed of the actual auction. Um, they have a variety of categories. Again, predominantly 19th and 18th century oil paintings with brown furniture, jewelry, watches, and decorative arts, and a variety of price points. I would say a relatively broad band of price points. From what I've seen of, of uh, uh, wh what I understand of, of their successes, it's been uh, predominantly in watches, but they are starting to see success in other areas. Uh, but watches was one of the places where they initially saw great success, and then that's been uh, rolling out uh, after that. Uh, Hi Hey, I think, is a very interesting model. Um, it's it's uh, fascinating. It's Beijing-based. It has no reserves. Uh, almost all the works are directly consigned from artists. Uh, uh, that being because many artists in China actually don't have representation. They, they manage their own uh, careers and consign directly to auctions. Um, and Hai Hei is a very, very interesting example of that. Uh, Christie's, as I mentioned, old establishment, reinventing itself. 
comparatively expensive to other online houses uh, like uh, Padlet or Auctionada. And then Artnet, which, uh, as, I, as I said, is, is they, they actually, uh, one interesting point about them is that they, um, they're one of the longest running online auction houses. They, they didn't start first, like Sotheby's back in 1999, but they started, I think, I want to say sort of 2006, I think, maybe 2000, sorry, 2007, somewhere around there. Earlier? Uh, long enough ago, so that they are actually still running. Uh, the company founded in the 1980s, but the online auctions was something that came about after uh, in the mid 2000s. But they are still running, so that that's th uh, that in of itself is impressive. They have had mixed success over the over those years, uh, with things uh, going going up and down uh, according to for different reasons. Uh, that's also something that we will get into in a little bit. Something that may be of rel uh, increased relevance or more relevance to um, to galleries. Uh, which, again, I'll get into why a selling platform might be more useful than an auction or an auction more useful than a selling platform in a minute, um, is uh, it, these selling platforms which essentially work with galleries to take inventory and put that, uh, your inventory, and put it online. Uh, obviously, there's a fee associated with that. So Artsy is one of those companies. Um, they are a gallery listing service, um, and they, they're perhaps best known for their art genome project, um, which was an effort to sort of uh, cross-associate artworks from different movements. Um, they also work very closely with art fairs, so they will actually preview art fairs online to their, to their community, uh, which can be an added benefit if you're participating in that, in that art fair. Uh, and they take a commission on any introductions. So if a client clicks on a work and says, I want to know more, I want to buy that piece, then they'll take it. That's how they make their money, is taking a commission on that. Um, Artnet has a similar uh, service. Um, this is a subscription paid service. You actually pay up front. Uh, they don't charge you based on uh, any uh, leads that they might offer, but they just charge you an annual fee. Um, that's actually been losing ground a little bit to, to Artsy. Um, so again, that, there's that whole uh, idea of competition coming into play. Exhibition A and uh, Saatchi Online, they are predominantly primary, although they have been known to work with galleries. They work with artists to offer prints on available for purchase in the primary market online. And then lastly, Artshare, which is Hong Kong based, is also a gallery listing service. Uh, and the, they group together artworks into curated selling exhibitions. So they pull works together uh, a little bit like uh, a little bit like an art fair, but the galleries aren't represented. It's just the works. Um, so you see sort of a curated uh, selling exhibition um, on online. Then there's the peripheral companies, and there's a few companies in this that fall into this category. But I've only drawn attention to a, 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 a core few. There's the databases that we all know. Uh, I'm sure everybody's familiar, as, with, as, as I've been saying. Artnet, there's Artprice, which um, sometimes has uh, less detailed information. Um, but for the most part, it's significantly less expensive so than Artnet. Um, so there's, there's a give and take there. Uh, Artron is a phenomenal resource if you have any interest in the Chinese art market. It can be a little bit difficult to navigate sometimes, but it is highly useful. Uh, Art Info has improved uh, fantastically over the years uh, and is also a free service and the, their data is at a level now where uh, they're, they're regarded as, as being quite competitive. Um, in the market analysis side of things, some of the names that you may recognize, uh, Tutela Capital, Capital is often regarded as the leader in the space and has been featured in a number of uh, articles around the world, one of which actually Edward drew attention to this morning, um, which was a, a, a nice uh, synergy going on there, maybe not entirely unintentional. <laughs> um, Art Tactic, uh, they produce a, an important report with Hiscox, also an online company that you can work with on doing different market analysis reports. Uh, Art Economics that does the TFAF TIF report. Artnet has an analytics uh, uh, portal as well. And then Skates provides detailed and important insight into the, uh, into the art market. Um, two things, well actually I guess maybe three things that I want to draw to attention to in social and, u and useful. Uh, first of all, Instagram, which we're going to come back to later on and I know has been a hot topic all morning. Um, Artstack, which I think is an interesting company, it's an online community where you join, uh, it's all art lovers and you essentially sort of 
uh, tag or, or uh, uh, pin, if you like Pinterest or any one of those things, artworks that you find are interesting, and then people within your community have access to see uh, what those artworks are, and you can follow other people. It's a very interesting sharing, sharing network. Uh, not hugely dissimilar uh, from Instagram, but a different take on the same theme. And then Artichek, which I actually think uh, is something that's quite interesting, relatively new company. Um, they have a mobile app which is, uh, uh, the intention is to make condition reporting very, very easy um, and, and uh, uh, effortless. And it's sort of the, the idea being that a, a condition report passes from person to person to person and gets updated through, through the app. Everybody uses the app. So it's, it, it, could, it could have a big impact on people's businesses in that, in that sense. Okay, so uh, as I said, I'm trying to move as quickly as possible. <laughs> um, so uh, case studies. Um, there's three companies that I want to draw attention to for uh, different reasons. Uh, the data revolution that Artnet brought about, the auction revolution that Paddle 8 has been leading, and the Instagram uh, and Instagram leading the access revolution. So with Artnet, I think it's uh, fascinating to see this company that was founded in the mid-80s still around and still being cited as the gold standard in data um, and access to that data. Um, they've, they've done an incredible job of just aggregating and aggregating and aggregating, and especially over the past few years, uh, working on improving the database product and cleaning it up and keeping it uh, consistent and, and useful for uh, what is what is a global community. Um, I think the the biggest thing here is that you have this, uh, uh, as I mentioned earlier, the sea change um, that took place when when Artnet started to allow access to its data. Uh, and I think, I mean, you can raise your hand if you think I'm wrong, but I would say pretty much everybody in this room uh, uses it or a version of a database on a fairly regular basis. Even if, you, even if you're in a primary market, it's important to see if or when your artist may come up at an auction at another time, that kind of thing. It does have other ancillary products. Uh, some have had mixed success. The online auctions, as I mentioned before, the gallery no network is losing some, some uh, uh, clients to competitors. Um, and the magazine, which uh, was for a long time unprofitable, was shut down, but it's just been sort of revamped into the new news division, which f from what I understand is doing quite well. Um, and it, it is a publicly traded uh, company, so you can see some of the excuse me, some of the results online uh, the in their annual reports. Um, their six-month report showed that there was a 20% decrease from Q1 to Q2, uh, which may not necessarily be uh, such good news because typically the second quarter in the art market is usu usually when sales are strongest. Um, and the price database, conversely, has actually uh, been a, a, a seen an uptick in revenue for them with going from 2.4 to 2.6 million euros uh, from year to year. The next uh, company that I just want to sort of, again, do a little bit of a focus on is, is Paddle 8. Um, a lot of people have heard about the company. Uh, everybody, p part of what I wanted to do here was, was drill down on, on what some of these companies do and what they are and how they can be useful. So in order to do that, I want to explain what, what, uh, what Paddle 8 is. Um, it's it's uh, uh, sort of often put in the same sentence as other companies as revolutionizing the online market, and in this case specifically auctions. Uh, there are benefit auctions as well as for-profit auctions, highly curated uh, with extensive partnerships. Some of examples there. Uh, going back to what I was saying before about uh, usability and uh, transactional process, uh, we've done, ev we've taken every effort to try and include all of those things uh, in in our business model, um, and that's borne out in the results. So in the first half, that should actually say 2014, not 13. In the first half of 2014, there was approximately $18 million sold, which compares to uh, a 400% increase over 2013 for the same time period. 60% um, of those net revenues came from the for-profit side of the company. Uh, all of this is in a press release that was uh, sent out a few weeks ago as well. So it's all, uh, and y again, you can, you can take the, uh, the slideshow home. Instagram. Instagram, I think, uh, as I say at the very bottom here, it represents uh, one of the 
biggest uh, changes in the art market. It has facilitated a huge, huge change. Um, it, it's phenomenal. You have a 200 million uh, strong community uh, recently bought by Facebook, so theoretically that could just keep going up to upwards of uh, however many hundreds of millions or billions uh, Facebook has in its community. Um, it is visual, which is exactly what the, uh, the art world uh, deals in. Um, so whether you're artists, galleries, auction houses, collectors, um, it is immediately uh, engaging because it, you are able to engage other people with uh, the very thing which you are interested in, which is uh, fantastic. I and it is not a selling platform, so there is no agenda. Uh, which is one of the reasons why I think it's fared so well, is because it's, it's, it's interesting. You want to see what uh, a collector that you like is collecting. You want to see what an artist you like is inspired by or is currently painting. Um, so I think there's, there's a, a, a number of reasons as to why uh, Instagram is, is often cited as, as one of the huge uh, game changers within, within the art world. Um, so how do you use all of these companies? Uh, what does it mean to you as a, uh, as a business? Uh, how can you use them to your advantage um, and to achieve your business goals? Uh, to that end, I think it's important to understand, uh, A, what these companies do, and I hope uh, we've shed a little bit of light on some of those, uh, and B, how they align with your business objectives, with your own internal objectives. Um, so what I mean by that is if your price points, if your selling price point is typically uh, average price is, is 20,000 euros, then you may not get as much uh, use or interest from using a platform like uh, Sotheby's or Christie's online sales. Um, I should say Christie's online sales because Sotheby's is not there yet. Um, because their average price points tend to be higher in their sales. Um, similarly, you, you, you maybe want to look, uh, maybe auctions are, may not be of interest because you're, using, you're working with a primary market artist um, and you're, you're more interested in uh, highlighting an upcoming art fair that you're going to be in, in which case maybe Artsy is the right platform or maybe Artshare is the right platform. Uh, perhaps you're more interested in uh, gaining a uh, uh, more of a pre presence in Asia, in which case Artron, which also has a listing service, or Artshare, which is based in Hong Kong, would be the right uh, uh, companies for you to be strategically thinking about um, or, or, or using. On the other side, perhaps there's inventory that you have within uh, your uh, uh, warehouse or within the gallery, whatever it may be, that you are interested in consigning to auction uh, and you want to uh, recoup the, the, the best possible value out of those works. In that case, you may want to start looking at online auctions, whether it's Paddle 8 or Auctionada, depending on what it is that you're selling. Um, each, uh, each platform will have a different offering, a different uh, strength. So Paddle 8's strength is predominantly in emerging and contemporary, and Auctionada's strength tends to be much more broad-based categories, whether you're talking about uh, more traditional uh, secondary market spaces, um, maybe it's uh, uh, oil paintings, 19th century oil paintings, or it's uh, modern art, something along those lines. Um, you have to be strategic about who you decide to work with. Um, so to take a few examples, I've uh, sort of thrown together some uh, case studies based on uh, companies that, that I work with, but unfortunately um, can't necessarily name directly. Um, this is Anonymous Gallery. They have a large budget. Their locations are, uh, they have locations in New York, LA, and London. They have a website which is constantly updated. Uh, they operate in the primary and secondary market, and they participate in many art fairs. Their clients are international, though most of them are in the US, and their price points vary from 10,000 to 1 million. Um, they actually uh, have a very active uh, Instagram and Twitter and Facebook accounts and Google Plus uh, art stack, things like that, but they also engage their artists as well. So they very specifically uh, call out and link to their artists' Instagram feeds and Twitter accounts and things like that. Because, as was mentioned earlier, uh, 
the sum becomes uh, greater than the individual parts. The, the whole, the entire community together, working as one organism, if you will, they all benefit from each other uh, in terms of linking to each other, in terms of supporting each other. So the gallery is very, very pro-artists um, uh, having an online presence, uh, having an online community that they speak to. Um, now, all of that goes is within reason, uh, as was pointed out earlier. Um, the and I'll get to in a minute the number of art artists who are being approached by people online to say I want to buy that is skyrocketing. And it's not just uh, I know I'm sort of being <laughs> somewhat U.S. centric, but it's not just the U.S. Um, I was talking to an artist yesterday who just came back from Iran. And she said the very first question that everybody asked her was, are you on Instagram? Um, so this is, this is global. This is a global phenomenon that we're talking about here. Um, so they're, they're very proactive in, in having that conversation with the artists that they work with to make sure that it's all part of uh, the, same, the same agenda. Um, they are also listed on Artsy, and they regularly consign to Sotheby's and Christie's, and they've occasionally consigned to us, which is why I've included them. Um, but this is their this is their online strategy. It is all in. <laughs> it is like as deep as you can get. They want to be part of everything, and they want everybody to know what they do and how to do it and how to get them. If you want to buy a piece, um, the next example uh, has the name Incognito Gallery, a completely different gallery. Uh, they are a medium budget gallery. They're located in New York. They do have a website, but they don't update it very often. Um, they also, uh, they primarily uh, uh, emerging artists, sort of uh, primary market dealers. Uh, they participate in a few art fairs in the, uh, but only really in the U.S. Their, U their clients are mostly U.S. based, and their price points are between a thousand and half a million. Uh, and they consign and sell regularly with us. Again, that's why I know them. Um, wh while we're on that point, actually, I do want to raise something which, uh, which Edward also mentioned this morning. W this isn't just for fun that I'm saying this. It, it's partly just for fun. Um, but it's also because one of the points that Edward made was uh, this idea of downturns and missed opportunities because of overheads were consistent and sales were missing in, uh, according to seasonality. Right? So anything you can do as a business in order to try and sell somewhere else that you're not able to sell physically where you are at that given point in time, if you can bridge that gap, then you're buying yourself more time and you're buying yourself access to those opportunities. So whether you're using Paddle 8, whether you're using Artsy, whether you're using Auctionado, whether you're using Artshare, whatever it might be, you have the ability to sell beyond your physical limitations I around where you may, may be, whether it's Berlin or whatever. So the, the, the real point that I'm trying to make here is that you have the, the ability to use online platforms, whether they are uh, communities, whether they are selling platforms or auction houses, whatever they may be, to help your business goals. One of those business goals is to bridge periods of uh, uh, downward sales, of, of lack of sales. So there's there's huge potential here. Um, so these people also oh sorry uh, these people also uh, primarily use Instagram, Twitter. They don't do much more than that because that's really where they've seen the majority of uh, of people interact with them. Uh, but they are also interested in Asian contemporary art, and they they uh, follow and use Artshare um, and uh, and closely watch the, uh, uh, Hi Hey as well. Um, the last case study that I wanted to point out is called Mystery Gallery, and they are a low-budget gallery uh, located in Pennsylvania. They have no website, none whatsoever, nothing, no online presence. Uh, they are exclusively secondary market, and they participate in zero fares, nothing whatsoever. Um, their clients are almost all in the East Coast US, and often they sell to uh, fellow individuals in the trade, and their price points are from 1000 to 100000 they have no social media. They have no online presence. They, con they can sign and sell very actively through us. So they actually, in a way, we are their only online presence. We actually list the name of the gallery in the provenance. But other than that, there's nowhere you can go. There's, the gallery doesn't exist online. Um, it, we've we've assumed their online presence. 
Uh, and their price points uh, with us are typically sort of one to $50,000, somewhere in that range. So th I, I hope this is sort of giving you an idea of the ways in which you can engage free online portals or uh, online portals where you're paying either uh, based on success or paying a subscription fee or whatever it may be. But the point is there are a number of different companies, online companies, which you can use to help support your business and to help you achieve your goals, uh, whatever they may be, whether they are promoting an artist, whether they are bridging, uh, uh, financial bridging in terms of, of, of poor sales, that kind of thing, or whether they are uh, being seen as, as leaders in the online space, which I think is uh, an interesting point given what, and I don't know if anybody saw the skates um, uh, report that came out uh, last week, they had fairly uh, sort of damaging criticism for galleries in general and their online presence. And they said that there is a massive hole with galleries who have, for whatever reason, uh, been left behind by their, predominantly by their artists who have fantastic online presence, but a lot of galleries have just sort of missed out and, and are not seen as in any uh, in a, a particular way revolutionary or, or, or anything like that or contributing to the online space. Along those lines, I want to just talk about very quickly before we move on to questions, Roadie Gallery, which I think is a really cool example of what's possible with uh, very, very little. So Rody Gallery has little to no budget, almost nothing. Uh, their location is pretty much anywhere. Uh, they have a website, it's pretty simple. Uh, they participate in no fairs, their clients are wherever the gallery is, and everything is consigned and sold out of a truck, and that's it. So they inform their community through their Twitter and Instagram accounts, and they tell people where they're gonna be, so they the side of the road, we're gonna be here, uh, right, right next to the Brooklyn Bridge, or whichever bridge that is, come by and see us. And that's it. And their strategy has been so successful, and they've gained such notoriety and following, that they've been uh, highlighted, and they had a uh, fairly extensive article in the New York Times just about these guys. And meanwhile, their price points are low. I mean, they're not selling like crazy high numbers or anything like that, but it's simply because they're... Um, they're, they're uh, social strategy, their online strategy, is so compelling and so interesting that they've created this fantastic following. Um, so with that, uh, here's a quick summary, which I've said five times already. Um, it's, uh, it's all about what you need in your business and which companies, which online companies fit what you want. Don't let it be the other way around. Don't let a company try and tell you, oh, you're perfect for this when in fact you're not. Or you may very well be in competition with each other. Um, it's up to you as a business owner to decide which partners make sense to you. Questions? Wow. <laughs> wow, because y you realize what you're saying, you're just saying, Galleries should consign works to an auction house, which is completely... Well, I mean, they do. So. I know, I know, I'm joking, but <laughs> it's just a remark. You don't yeah. realize how revolutionary what you say is just saying. It's just what you're saying it is. But more fun fundamentally, I mean, Paddle 8, I've been following them since the beginning. You, you started with kind of um, curated exhibitions where you were selling and taking four p trying to, to get a 4% commission on the, on the, on the things. Yes. Then you got, uh, you got to the... Um, to the uh, benefit auction house, and you know, you worked with the, the for the uh, for the fairs as well. You tried on that side too, and then uh -huh. you, you went to um, to the um, uh, benefit auctions, and now to the auctions. Mm -hmm. um, what I, where I have a problem as, as a collector now is that why are we calling uh, a sale of art, an art sales, an auction? Because it's also a phenomenon we see in auction houses now. You know, for example, about Africa or things like that. It's supposed to be an, a, an auction, but it's not because it's coming from from directly from the galleries. So why would anybody buy at auction something they can buy directly at the same price in in the gallery? Um, often it's not the same price. So although galleries and dealers do consign to us extensively, I would say the split is. 
typically 50-50 with, uh, it's actually less than 50-50 because we have other consignments from other places. Um, but if we have a work consigned to us from a dealer, for example, um, and the expectation is for that work to be priced the, with the starting bid at the retail price, then we won't accept the piece. S the, the real value of auctions is to, it's, it's a totally different structure than galleries and dealerships. And I 100% recognize that. Um, and I think it's one of the reasons why we have so many consignments from galleries and dealers, because it's an opportunity for the market to express or to show what it's willing to bear. So invariably, our price points for bidding start well below what, what a retail price would be at a gallery or with a dealer. And then the bidding comes in, and the bidders themselves will work up to a price where they feel comfortable uh, that the, the, the market is at. And we let the market speak in that sense. So it's, it's a slightly different uh, structure. 100% none whatsoever. I will not. It doesn't happen. It does not happen. No. Because I see it. I see everything. Uh, Silva. A question from a collector. It's interesting is that the, the first reactions come from collectors. <laughs> it's, uh, yes. it's quite amazing. Uh, two things. First, I'm a little bit uneasy with the word curated. You're using curated. Uh, curated is using... Uh, by all these online uh, platform. And uh, I, I don't really know what is for them th the word curating, but for me, curating is something a I'm little I'm happy bit to show you, so that. No, no, but well, no, for me, it's five something. Five minutes after. No, 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 but I know. I'm I just know. kidding. I'm no, just no, I'm just, <laughs> no, it means that for me, curating is, is something a little bit, a uh, little bit perhaps different. Uh, what also is interesting, you, you uh, uh, all the platform that you have, uh, you know, spoke about, spoken about, you didn't spoke, speak about artifacts, for instance. Sure. And Artifact is a very important platform, mm -hmm. but it's not linked with money. It's linked with uh, the rank of an artist in terms of his creativity. So you, don't, you think that today uh, creativity is no more important uh, in the way people choose art? Uh, I think it's very important, and I think it always will be important. And I think you're touching on something which is a, a much bigger subject. Um, which is that the art market isn't one market. Uh, the art market is many, many markets. Um, and within the art market, you have some people who collect primary artists. You have some people who collect uh, old master drawings. You have some people who collect because they passionately believe in the artist that they're collecting. And then you have other people who collect because they think it's uh, going to be a good investment. Uh, they all live under the umbrella that we give this sort of term, the art market. Um, and I think it's, it's to our detriment, actually, that it is sort of put into one bucket. Because I would never claim that the financial markets are one market. There are many markets. And uh, as much as commodities might move in one direction and uh, equities move in another, I wouldn't lump them all into the same uh, category. So I 100% think that you are right, that there are collectors out there who collect because of pure and, and emotional and uh, resonating creativity, um, because they s this is part of a bigger market. And then there are other collectors out there who are doing it because they think they're going to make money. Um, and the market accommodates both. Uh, I would like to hope that our target is everybody. <laughs> um, maybe that's, uh, that's too ambitious. Um, but one of the reasons why our auctions are curated um, to the extent that they are, and to give you, I don't, I don't know if we have internet connection, but I could, I could give you a quick example. Um, one of the reasons why they are curated is because we are passionate about uh, presenting artwork as artwork and, and b putting it within context of, uh, I of, of its peers or its uh, 
aesthetic um, kind of sisters, if you will. Um, and when I th what I think of as curated I is partly that, is that you want to present artwork in, uh, in a position that is sort of sympathetic to where it came from and why it came about. Um, and, and informs you, uh, it, it sort of give, it expresses more than the, than the work may on its own. W and we, we very much believe in that in when we put together our curated auctions. We have other auctions which are straightforward uh, contemporary auctions, um, which are curated to a degree, but for the most part it's works that we've been sent uh, which will we we know are of interest and, and exciting and desirable, and we put them into what you would see in uh, sort of a day sale at Sotheby's or something like that. Um, but our curated sales have a very specific mandate, um, and and they are curated, uh, and and often works will be uh, pulled out or selected uh, from from a, a specific group. Um, so it is very very uh, detailed and sort of am ambitious in its scope. Ah, I see Conrado is holding up a sign that says five minutes. Can you tell us a bit more about how to uh, how the galleries manage the s the auction? Like during the auction, do they advertise or not? And how do they manage the result of it? Like having sold below the mm. list price or much higher than mm. that? Um, it depends on the gallery. Uh, in terms of how they advertise. So, uh, of course, we ask uh, all of our consigners to promote their sales. Um, some do, some don't. Uh, some galleries are very active, and they will link uh, the sale directly on their Facebook, on their Twitter feeds, things like that, or they'll even uh, share it on in Instagram. Others don't. Uh, we have no uh, uh, requirements that consigners do, but we like it when they do. Um, in terms of results, uh, I can tell you I don't know what that means. Um, I can tell you that uh, um, our results are, we, we, we operate like a, uh, a private auction. So we do not publish our results. If something sells, uh, nobody knows. If something doesn't sell, nobody knows. Uh, it closes as a private auction and no sales results are released. Um, other auction houses uh, don't operate like that and some of them do. Um, but. I, all I know is, is uh, that's how we handle it. So the, the, it's, it's one thing that our consigners love most about our platform is that it, it does operate like a private auction and if something doesn't sell, you haven't burnt the work. What is uh, your position in relation to what has been sort of uh, been spoken about of integrity and the proper place for art and the proper, play, the proper way to communicate or like to yeah, make it available, let's say. How does this, like, rare watches and other objects come together with that? Is that in your... Well, uh, that's a function of the businesses themselves expanding into new verticals. So Sotheby's and Christie's, they sell rare watches, um, they sell jewelry, they sell wine. Um, so it's no different than uh, any of these other online companies uh, exploring the same verticals. Uh, I can tell you that from our perspective, from Padel 8's perspective, um, we are very interested in um, partnering uh, items which are uh, desirable and interesting uh, across categories. So sometimes we will have a, a, a beautiful modernist uh, vase uh, paired with a uh, fun kind of very contemporary Lucian Smith print or something like that. And then again with uh, maybe a drawing by Louise Bourgeois. And if it all makes sense and if they all speak to each other in a way which resonates with, we think resonates with our collectors, we are more than happy to, to pair them together to show people that, that uh, or to be sympathetic to the fact that I, I don't think, and we don't think collectors collect according to 
uh, like a paint by numbers. They don't collect like, oh, I just bought a Warhol, now I'm going to buy a Rauschenberg, and now I'm going to buy a Lichtenstein, or whatever it may be. They collect because it's, it's, it's part of their aesthetic. So maybe one day they'll buy a Warhol, but maybe the next day they'll buy a vase, and maybe the next day they'll buy a uh, 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 Patek Philippe watch or something like that. So it's, it's very much about the aesthetic that they surround themselves with, um, and th they, they're in a way curating their life uh, to, to a degree. Hi. Um, first of all, of course, thank you for your very compelling presentation. You certainly represent your company very well. <laughs> um, I, I wanted hope to it wasn't too much. No, it's okay. Uh -huh. um, I wanted to ask you, um, auct all auction providers, in the end of the day, are object-based businesses. So you sell mm -hmm. the work, and it doesn't really distinguish to whom you sell it to. Part of the gallery work is to place works of art. And part of creating the career of an artist is to place these works well in the right collections, in museum institutions, and so on and so forth. So for the validation of a client, which is essentially what the gallery needs to know, really to expand their, um, well, to continue on their mission for the artists, one of the problems I've seen in the online world, basically, when, in particular when you sell to auction, is you have no control to whom you sell. So what do you recommend for galleries um, in order to see to give to have uh, for them to have the choice or the possibility of a choice um, to decide who is actually buying the works so it's not going to be to the next flipper who flips it and so on and so forth um. I, I, I'll answer but I don't know if you'll like my answer <laughs> um, I don't think there is control and I think the idea of control is uh, not real. Um, and I think trying to control is actually wasted effort. Um, I think the, the effort should be placed in trying to work around something that is already going to happen. Uh, you can't stop people from buying pieces. If you represent an artist that's doing well and that is being bought up and, and people are, are buying that artist, then then lucky you, <laughs> and figure out how to work around that. Because it's, it's a balance. On the one hand, you are responsible for that artist market. You're responsible, for, as you said, for placing that in museums, for making sure that it's with the right people, and so on and so forth. But th in that case, you've done your job. You've done it very, very well. Your, your concern, if, if I'm right, is that the, the market will burn out, and that all of a sudden that artist will take off, and you lose control. And I think w what you have to do is, is, as Edward was sort of alluding to earlier as well, it, you have to have that conversation with your artist in the first place to say, if this happens, how are we going to deal with this? I don't think you can say, if this happens, we will shut all the doors and pretend that it isn't happening or do everything we can to stop it from happening. But I think if you participate in it, you, ha you will have the opportunity to influence it more than than sort of putting your feet in the ground and saying, I don't want any part of this. Um, so that would be my advice, is to it's, it's going to happen one way or the other. So um, what you have said is, is I would continue, uh, it is absolutely crucial where uh, the artworks of a young artist are going. Mm -hmm. So that means uh, you c an artist can have uh, success online, but he or she will never enter the local most important museum by an auction. You, I mean, you, um, you, you can't know. It depends on mm, how you do it. Um, and mm, it depends on the artist. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. I no, but uh, what I wanted to say is uh, that for us galleries, um, it is just, it is this online uh, auctioning and online sales from your platforms, as you describe it, they are really very tough comp competitions to our to a gallery. Um, galleries usually are faced with the accusation that they are not transparent, 
Nobody can control their sales. There are strange waiting lists. There is no transparency. The opposite is what you are representing. Uh, there is transparency. All the sales are online. You can see all the prices. This is really tough competition. But a fact is that um, in auctions and also online auctions, there are after sales, there are supported sales, mm -hmm. there are lies, there are not real facts. Uh, but for yeah, galleries, it's I'm very not, difficult I'm not, I'm to. I'm not so sure about the lies. <laughs> now, yeah, you know what do I mean, lies? You know, when I remember the first auction, Russian contemporary art, mm -hmm. uh, it was Sotheby's. Um, uh, and the cover piece of the catalog, a young Russian artist, nobody knew him, uh, sold for $30,000. That, I was working at that time. Oh, my time is over, obviously. Ah, ah yeah, ah. no. Um, you know, I was working in that field, and the result of this first auction house with Russian art on, ho on the whole market on Eastern Europe was tremendous. Artists were rising their prices from one day to the other, from $2,000 to $20,000 mm -hmm. from the studio. Afterwards, it turned out it was not a real sale. It was, uh, it was, um, mm, it was not really sold, and the, the money was first lended to the buyer, but in the end, and so on and so on. This is what I mean, lies. But it was published, of, of course, widely. How can a gallery compete, or how can all the galleries together compete with this? Um, uh, second, um, we, the galleries are, are working to establish a primary market and then, in the following, a secondary market. Um, but what online auctions are doing, uh, in many cases, with young artists, of course, uh, is going directly, you know, from auction to uh, I mean, there is no primary market, there is already the secondary market, I would call it. I, and I, the primary I, I market is important yes. to establish, to build up the career of an artist, still. Um, to, to your first point, I think, um, the, uh, of course, there are going to be instances where in what is hundreds of thousands of transactions a year across Sotheby's, Christie's, Phillips, Bonhams, uh, whoever it may be, there are always occasions where a sale may, may fall through for whatever reason. And can there be ramifications for that? Sure, but are they intended ramifications? I'm, I'm not so sure. Um, I think I in the example that you cite, I would be surprised if there was any malice uh, or, or uh, um, sort of uh, premeditation behind it. Um, I do think that there are that the art market is one of the least regulated markets out there. That th there is no question about that, um, and I and I personally believe that it could do with more regulation and uh, similarly more transparency. Um, and I think everybody would benefit from that. Um, but I, I on on the flip side, I I don't think that I mean we don't I know personally for with our company. Um, but we don't participate in any kind of uh, rigging or anything like that. Um, we are a very straightforward, very transparent platform. Um, to your other point about uh, uh, dealers and, and galleries working predominantly in the primary market and establishing and building an artist's career, um, I think you're right, and I think that's important. And I think artists um, have to uh, make sure that the galleries that they're working with represent them in the way they want to be represented. Whether that means I want to take 10 years to develop my career or I want to take two. Um, the, the artist, as much as the gallery, that's an internal business decision. So as much as the artist has to have a business head, which can sometimes be difficult with an artist, um, the gallery also has to have a business head and say, okay, well, if you want to be famous in two years, I'm not the right place for you. I want you to be famous or successful in 10 years. Because I'm, I'm more interested in, as uh, again, to sort of reference Edward again, uh, I, I'm more interested in building the business that I want um, and, uh, and, and, and working with people who have a similar vision. Um, so while there are artists on online platforms uh, such as ourselves, such as Paddle 8, 
um, who may have been producing relatively recently, um, they're also uh, in a situation where sometimes it's in their control, sometimes it's not. But as I was saying before, I think the advantage comes from the gallery acknowledging um, what is in their control and what isn't and working around that to make sure that they are protecting the artist as and representing them as best they can. And if there's some concern about uh, too rapid an increase or whatever it may be, then have a, uh, a an agreed upon strategy to deal with that. Um, I, what worries me is the notion or the idea that it can be stopped when it can't. Um, there comes a point at which the market just, it is the market, and it's bigger than any one individual or any one business. We're done. Sorry. I am, <laughs> I am really sorry, but we need to finish here because we've been pressed by the museum itself, who needs to stop, who needs to stop as well. So, Thomas, thank you very much. Thank you.